have a really really special guest. My today's guest is called the common man in political process, known for his kindness, passion for volunteering, and understanding of the issues and struggles that a common man goes through in everyday life. He's been working passionately for Lakefront community where his family roots run four generations deep. And that place is one of the most beautiful place in the Peel region. His motto is that he wants to see every family prospering in Canada and Canada to be in one of that categories. Without going further, I would like to welcome Mr. Rudy Cosato in my show. Thank you and happy Valentine's to you as well and to everybody in uh, Toronto, Mississauga, Peel, across Ontario, across Canada, across the world. Happy Valentine's. Good morning and a very happy Valentine's Day to you as well. How are you celebrating this day with your family and wife? Well, uh, my wife went for a walk right now and I drove to the office to do this interview with you. So I'll be back with her later on today. And be honest, later on today, I will be going to uh, feed some uh, uh, under fortunate people with some pizza today, as well as I'm going to go volunteer at a food bank with my wife today as well. That's the best gift you can give to the community and to the world on Valentine's Day especially. And I know your family, your wife, your kids, they are all too much into volunteering and helping the people around the city. It's, it's a very big thing, you know, uh, and one thing that is very much famous about you is that you deliver more than you commit to the people. You are a giver. And one can anytime find you and your family volunteering in the city. I appreciate it. That that's true. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm always working. I have my office working around the clock to find things that we can donate to the less fortunate in the community. We were fortunate to even get, uh, what was it? The uh, first shipment of Lysol wipes and Lysol sprays. And I, you know, it was, uh, I think 3,000 bottles of each, and we gave them out to our long-term care, our, our uh, seniors' homes, our daycare, because I look at it, if we can prevent one case of COVID, that's one case less we could have in our hospital, so we can get this economy back open as soon as possible. I have so much to talk to you. We'll go one by one. No problem. <laughs> Thank you for being so nice. Uh, before being elected, you worked at Ford Motor Company of Canada for 31 years, and most recently you were uh, you working there as an auditor. So how are you using your extensive work experience in shaping up Canadian politics? Well, I'll be honest, I, when I first started Ford Motor Company, I started the, on the assembly line. So I knew what it meant to work on the line. And I knew, too, every time that line would go down, that was approximately $50,000 a minute that you would lose. So yeah. you have to try, and that's in, in the business. So in government, you should look at how you spend the money because at the end of the day, it's your money, the taxpayer's money, and you should spend it efficiently, right? And that's what we're doing at the Treasury Board. I've been uh, appointed the parliamentary assistant to the president of the Treasury Board, Peter Bethenfaldi, which now is the finance minister as well for internal audits. And we have to find ways that we can save money and government. And that's what we're, we've been doing over the last uh, three years. It's something very great. I really appreciate what you're sharing with me. Um, what brought you in politics? Well, I've always been involved in politics. I was involved in the, uh, as a young volunteer, putting up signs, uh, dropping off literature in the early 80s with the Brian Mulroney government and Bill Davis, uh, our premier of Ontario, so I, I always enjoyed politics and uh, I never thought I would run in politics. Because I always like to be behind the scenes instead of being out front, because when you're out front, you know, the criticism's on you all the time. You, you yeah. go to the grocery store, people are stopping you, which I enjoy because I enjoy talking to people, but you don't really have time for your family. And so your family has to sacrifice for you. And uh, it's very difficult. It's, you know, there's times that, you know, we'd like to go somewhere and I can't go because there's something I have to do for our community. Yeah. Right? So it's very difficult for family. And thank God I have a supportive family. And that's yes, very it's, important. It's a very big commitment. And you sacrifice a lot to help the society, help the people around you. Yeah. 
Uh, well, like I said, during COVID, uh, we were just looking at my what I've done during COVID. I've done 400 donations in the community. As I, I've even gone as far as uh, Barry, uh, Man I had, I had shipped food to Manitoulin Island with Minister Tobolo. Like we've done so much for, uh, during this uh, pandemic, and I think the pandemic has opened our eyes. You know, as as you know, not only government uh, officials but the whole public, what we really what we really need in life, because you know, we don't need as much as we do have. You know, like we should give more. And that's what I, I, that's my motto is to give as much as I can back to my community where, like you mentioned, my family goes back here four generations in the yes. poor credit area. You know, I, I was unfortunate to lose my father when I was 19 uh, due to a Thank special. That, from the, ref there was a refinery here in poor credit and he worked yeah. there in 1953. And, uh, you know, he caught us, uh, asbestos was, went into his lungs and he died from cancer from asbestos. So, you know, and I realized that, you know, there's life is very short. So you got to do whatever you can for your community and feel good about it. Yes. Sorry to hear about your father. Thank you me. lost him at a very young age. Uh, the pandemic has a huge impact, as you said. Every one of has been affected in some or the other way. When I was going through your profile, one of the duties that caught my attention was you being in the auditing committee. And you can see that effect. We are in a huge amount of deficit. I can't even figure out how much dollars, millions or billions. So how do you see Canada becoming prospering again? Well, the first thing is we have to get the vaccine, right? Without the vaccine, we won't be able to move forward. So the quicker we get the vaccine from the federal government uh, and, you know, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, the better we'll be because we have to get this economy going as quick as possible. You know, from last year to this year, we've spent an extra twenty-five billion dollars in the province of Ontario. Like, you know, I'm saying not millions, billions of dollars. Billions. Like, people can't understand billions. Like, it's very hard to understand. Yes. You know? So, you know, and we're running a thirty-eight billion dollar deficit in the province of Ontario. So this is how I look at it. And I do this at my own home. When I used to work for Ford Motor Company, and I, you know, you got paid overtime for working. I would put that money aside for a rainy day when you're not working. Right? Yes. And that's what government should do. You don't spend when the, it's good times. You try to pay off your, your debt, your deficit, yes. or, or in families, you try to pay off your mortgage, your line of credit, right? And then when the bad times come, you have the money to spend. You don't have to borrow again. And that's the problem is borrowing the money all the time. And that's what we're doing right now because we previous governments spent in good times, right? They didn't put money away. And that's what we're trying to do here, you know, in the province of Ontario under the Premier Doug Ford and uh, uh, Minister of Finance, Peter Bethenfaldi. I can very much see how you are uh, sharing your experience of working with Ford Company in shaping up the politics today. Well, coming to the next question, Bill 219, the Life Settlements and Loan Act 2020, was introduced by you as a private member bill. It would modernize the Section 115 of the Insurance Act. Today, the bill is with the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. Now, that bill, I, I introduced that bill because I looked at it. You know, I look at our seniors here in the province. of It's not only seniors, but, it, you know, most people are in that that category will fall under seniors. A lot of them, 80 percent of our seniors do not pay out their insurance or they usually lapse because they can't afford to pay it at the end because it's too expensive when you're retired, because if you're looking at $1,200 a month or even higher, they cannot afford it. So why not give them the opportunity to sell their life insurance? We do it in Quebec. We do it in the US. We do it in the UK. We do it in Japan. The rest of the world does it except Ontario. So why shouldn't we give our seniors that opportunity? Now, you know, you, you the the negative part, you get the insurance companies saying that, you know, there could be fraud. Well, we've done that research yeah. as well. It's 0.1% of fraud on that. There's more complaints about your insurance company and your agents than fraud on life insurance around uh, the yeah, world. Yeah, but, but this is banned. This kind of practice is banned in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Yes, it is. It's been, but they did not do really any consultation on that. You know, okay. they banned it without any consultation. They didn't even know what was going. They passed the bill so quickly that they weren't even aware of what was going on. That's why 
you know, we're it's not, already at second read, made second reading. It's going to the standing committee right now. And, you know, we want debate on it. We we want people to say yes or no to it. And I've spoken to seniors groups across the province of Ontario, and they're all in favor of giving the choice. It's it's about choice. It's not about the life insurance. It's about choice for our seniors. You yes. know, that is an asset. I have one senior. He has a multiple, a multiple sclerosis, right? And he wants, he doesn't have any beneficiaries. He doesn't have anyone to leave this money to. And, but he needs money for his health to, you know, and why shouldn't he be able to sell it yes. at three or four times the value of instead of surrendering it and be able to use it for his own health? I think the insurance company should more, be more than happy to help people. And I think that's what it, it comes down to is helping people. Yes, as long as it doesn't get misused or being trafficked, it's a very good act. Well, like I said, 0.1%. Yes. Okay, without going further, I would like my team to play the video which they have made for you. Oh, thank you. I really want to thank you for that video. You know, one thing I can say is whenever this ends for me as an MPP representative, I will, I can say, I'm, I'm breaking up right now. I can say that I will be proud of what I've done for my community. Thank you. I have to thank you and the other MPs, the the leaders, our healthcare workers, our frontline workers who are working day and night to make our life comfortable and safe. Okay, Thanks. coming to the next question. With the average house prices in the city going so high, more than $600,000, affordable housing is like a dream. And it's not a problem only for the low income families but it has been one of the very big issue of the rising cases with the domestic violence women as well. They choose to live with their violent partners only because they cannot afford the unreasonably high rent and the housing prices. What is your party planning to do on this? Well, what we've been doing already as a party here, uh, I'll tell, I have an example right here in Mississauga Lakeshore. Uh, we're building affordable homes right here and we've got to continue building affordable homes. We have a a unit that we built here, we're building right now on an accelerated build, right? Um, that we're building 219 units right here, which is great, but we need like 219 units is great for a little area, but we have to build much, much more. And, uh, and that's where the government uh, has to work together with the city and the regions. And like, if we know on this location here, we use it's called a MZO, it's called a ministerial zoning order where the minister comes in with the approval of the city and the region and they say, okay, let's move quickly. Let's not worry about, you know, doing, you know, A, B and C. You know, you guys agree that we can build here. Let's build here and move forward. Because if we wait and go through every little approval, the red tape, which is called in government, right? It'll take four to five years to build the same location where we could build in a year. And we're doing it as well for long-term care in Mississauga Lakeshore at Sheridan Park, 
we're building 640 beds in one area. And this is unbelievable when we look at the previous government that only built 611 beds across the whole province of Ontario. Like we're just building that here and we're doing all these accelerated builds through the province of Ontario. And that long-term care should be open at the end of 2021, at the beginning of 2022. And that's what we have to do as a government is build quickly for yeah. homes and long-term care. Yes, of course, we need more and more of that. Plus, uh, we can't ignore how they much are suffering during this pandemic. As you said earlier, this pandemic has opened up the eyes. We've been spending more than we need. And when we talk about this long-term care and the senior citizens, this vulnerable people of society, right. they are very much depressed at the moment. Talking about my own uncle, he's in long-term care in Mississauga, where is they had an outbreak, I think, 10 days back. He's so upset and so depressed at the moment. He says, I don't want to live anymore. I'm confined to one room from last 11 days. Right. It's been very difficult in long-term care. It's very hard. It's like slow death to them. Yeah. But, you know, like the, the one thing about the pandemic that has opened everybody's eyes is how long-term care has been run for the last 20 yes. years. It's been terrible. Let's be honest. Like, I'm not going to, you know, but, you know, we're the first government that's put a minister for long-term care. We had started to get rid of the four in the room, the quads, right? But then the pandemic hit because, you know, we have to move over to the single rooms or the double, right? And so that's what we've been doing as a government. Not only that, we're building long-term care. Like I said, the previous government only built 611 beds in 15 years. We're, we're going to build 15,000 over five years. Right. But not only that, we've given four hours of care to our seniors. But to implement that, there's going to be an issue. And I'll tell you what the issue is. And a lot of people go, well, you can implement it right away. We don't have enough PSWs because with all the long term care we're building in the province, we're going to need 26,000 PSWs through the province of Ontario. So what we're going to do, what we're doing right now is working with the federal government to open up immigration so we can immigrate people that would like to be PSWs in the province and then train them and then have them out in the workforce. Yeah, I would just want, wanted to ask about this PSWs only, the care thing only you mentioned that. That's so sweet of you uh, because it's not only the construction of the long-term cares, it's the care that actually they deserve, that they need right. and that we all should be worried about how we can give our services to them. Well, that's why we passed the bill to give them, give our seniors four, because before they were getting 2.7 hours of care. Now we've increased it to four hours of care, but we need PSWs and that's what we're doing. We're hiring PSWs. But like I said, like, even if we, we, we've already exhausted PSWs in the province, we have to open up immigration with the federal government to get more PSWs here, right? Thank you so much, Mr. Rudy, for coming on my show. I have so many things to ask you, but then I have my time limitation. No problem. <laughs> Maybe again in coming time, I'll invite you again. And I have a huge list of questions, even from our viewers, which I couldn't ask you today. <laughs> you have set an example, an ex amazing example of how a common man can excel in politics and help our society grow. Please continue to do all the work you have been doing and stay safe. God bless you. And thank you. And uh, like I said, I wish you guys all again a happy Valentine's today. Take care and have a great day. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.